Um, just as by a point of introduction, um, I always like to start a presentation like this by sort of uh, giving you sort of a, a bit of a bit of my background, because while I, I am a trained meteorologist, um, I, I got my training in the Air Force. I don't really consider myself a scientist. I'm more of a practitioner of leveraging weather information to help decision makers um, optimize the way that they just to, to make decisions for things that are weather related. Um, the, the relevance in terms of my background in being trained in the Air Force is that in the, in the Air Force or in the military, weather information is used very specifically to influence operational plans. So think about uh, the D-Day invasion and how that was timed based on the weather forecast. Um, and it was a very, very precise and very close weather forecast. In fact, the first day they had to turn the entire fleet back because the forecast wasn't quite right. But when, in fact, they did find, whoops, when they did actually execute the invasion, part of the reason for the surprise was that we had a better forecast than the Germans. So I always like to say a weather man won World War II, or certainly contributed greatly to it. Um, so I actually spent 20 years in the Air Force. Um, I retired very, very young, um, about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and was hired by a firm here in, in uh, Philadelphia, actually owned by the Fox family. Uh, so Dick Fox, who's, who is uh, the, the, the uh, Temple's Business School was named after, he started a firm that had acquired a long-range weather forecasting technology, and they brought in people like me from the Air Force to help sort of take that data and uh, create or innovate ways to use the data in industry so that people in industries could use the information to make better long-range planning decisions. And we ended up working very specifically with retailers. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how retail and retailers are more and more using weather information to optimize the way they plan and they market and then they distribute products. Uh, so that's sort of a, a quick background. Um, I, you know, my la the last 15 years or so, I've been working with industry. So Walmart, um, Kmart, Sears, one of the large insurance companies. Um, uh, you just about can name the type of, of industry that I've been working with. And so that when I when I say when I started off this, I'm not really a scientist. I'm more of a practitioner. I'm very literally a practitioner, somebody who uses weather information to help um, companies either make better decisions or now that I'm with the Weather Channel, advertise better. And, and more smartly. So what I'm going to do today is sort of give you an overview of, of the weather. Um, the weather impacts on consumers in general. Um, the current environment, in other words, what, what we're looking at and, and how the weather has been changing over the last few years, and then how the, the sort of convergence of, of technology and new and enhanced forecasting capabilities is, is coming together to provide what I believe will be a, a real revolution in terms of the use of environmental data in, in optimizing the way that, first, you know, we all live our lives, but also the way that businesses respond to and um, uh, actually uh, gain and profit from volatile, volatile weather. So when I sort of gave you that overview in terms of the way that the military uses weather information, weather information and environmental information has been used for hundreds and hundreds of years in terms of tactical planning and strategic planning. And of course, in the, in the military, it's used in a very processed and programmatic way to optimize decisions and optimize the way that we that we go to war. Literally, um, it's looked at in the military as a weather information you know applied correctly is looked at as a force multiplier. If you know something that the other guy doesn't know, then you can then you can adjust your tactics and and um, prevail simply based on having better intelligence, better idea of what's going to happen in the future and a better idea of how the, the historical weather has impacted military operations. So I start this, this presentation with this to sort of frame everything else I'm going to be talking about. Because what I've been doing since I left the Air Force was, was working to take those same competencies and sort of bridge those into the commercial world. So investors and, and businesses um, could use this kind of weather and environmental information to make, just to make better, uh, to be make better and more informed decisions about any number of different um, sort of business solutions. And the, and the weather is, in, is, is important because it has a significant impact on the economy. Now there's, there's a lot of numbers that have been thrown around out there in terms of the impact and the size of the impact on the economy. Uh, the Commerce Department has been out for years. Of course, NOAA, the National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, falls under the Commerce Department. Um, and the sort of the uh, default number that they've always used is uh, that the impact of the weather on the, the economy is about, there's about a 30% impact on the, on the economy overall, net-net. This past summer, 
This group out of the uh, NCAR, National, uh, uh, it's a, an NSF funded, NOAA funded group out of, uh, out of Colorado did a study, a, a much more detailed study of normal weather. Uh, this doesn't contemplate severe weather, hurricanes and things like that. And they came up with a number of about $485 billion, or about 3.4% of the GDP is being influenced by normal weather. Reds and oranges represent warmer than normal. Um, warmer than, and when we start talking about the weather, the, the, the weather that has the most influence on all of us as consumers is weather that's outside of like one standard deviation. So if it's normal weather in January, it, it, doesn't, have, it doesn't have that big of an influence in terms of causing people to act uh, unusually. But once we move outside of that, then we start to see different kind of impacts. So you can see January, really warm. And where it's red, it's like smoking hot. That's 50 in Chicago and no snow in Indiana, uh, <clears throat> International Falls, Minnesota. It was just, it's unusually, obviously unusually warm. But what we think is gonna happen is that colder air, so, the, so we're here, will we'll start to sweep down across the country, um, keeping us still in the relatively mild conditions. So through January, we'll have cold snaps, but they won't necessarily be long, drawn out ones. And, and it doesn't mean we won't have snow. Then we're looking at, and by the time we get into March, where Florida, it's gonna be nice, the spring will break early. I'll talk about the hurricane in a second when we're down here. But the northern part of the country looks like it's gonna sort of settle in and we'll start to get that cold weather. So typically what happens then when you have a colder March, that it starts to impact uh, retail because uh, March is a very highly correlated month to, um, to just sort of retail activity since the start of the spring. So in some ways, I was talking to one of our retail customers yesterday, the weather has been, for, for certain retailers that sell a lot of like seasonal apparel, the weather's been sort of out of sorts or out of sync with what they would like. They would ideally would like it to be cold in winter and, and warm in spring. But this year's, I call it kind of a, it's been a bizarro winter. So it looks like we may see the colder air really finally not settle down until we get to until we get to March. Can you say something about the lack of snow pack in the West? Because yes. even though it's colder than average, it's probably going to be a nasty summer in terms of fire hazards, isn't it? That's right. It's very it's very interesting. And in California, the snow pack represents a big big portion of the of the water needs of California. And they basically, the, the, the snowpack acts like a frozen reservoir. <coughs> and it's a pretty good system, you know, when it works. So you've got this frozen reservoir and then they sort of tap into it when they need it. Um, this year, and the last two years have been very, very good, good years. The, the, the good news is there's, there's plenty of, the, the reservoirs are full. The bad news is that we're way off at this point. We're way off. I, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I want to say it's only like 25% <coughs> of normal or something like that. And in California, they only make snow until about the 1st of April. So we've got between now and the 1st of April to try to make up for that. And if we don't, then it'll have downstream implications on, on California. California agriculture, uh, fire hazard. Um, of course, the ski resorts are getting hurt. Um, uh, across the board, are getting hurt. Um, although there's fresh powder today up in, the, in, in some areas. But yeah, it's been very, very difficult. And so it's been a, you know, it's been a very tough year for snow. But you know, on the flip side, last year was the exact opposite. And it has interesting implications even here in terms of uh, uh, municipalities not having to spend for snow removal where last year they did. Um, but then there's people that are in the snow removal business that are it's just completely a boom or bust. And, and uh, this will be another whole other hour of conversation, but then now there's a whole market on the CME where you can trade snowfall futures and options to hedge, out, to hedge that out, which I think after this year, um, May, may start to become more liquid. It is liquid right now. 